our study. We're studying right now through 1 Thessalonians. You know, our practice is on Sunday mornings here at Calvary, we go through the Bible book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We do what is called expository preaching. And um, really, it's a way to let God set the agenda and, and to be directed through his text. And so we're in right now 1 Thessalonians, going to be in chapter 2. We learned as we, a couple weeks ago, I had, was gone last week out of town at my brother Micah's wedding, but the previous week when we looked at chapter 2, at the beginning of it, we learned that while Paul was in Acts, I'm sorry, we learned in Acts, while Paul was on his missionary journey, <laughs> that he, him and Silas ran into some opposition. In fact, it, was a, it became a great trial to them in the physical form. And it, the scripture tells us that they were beaten and they were thrown into jail, but there was something amazing that happened. And it became this great principle and great lesson for us, and I think an encouragement to our faith, is that we saw that through that trial that Paul and Silas were in, that God provided this miraculous deliverance. And through this miraculous de deliverance, we saw that the jailer got saved, and not only the jailer, but his whole household. And at the end of that, we see that Paul then comes to Thessalonica with great boldness. This is what we read. Look at chapter 2, verse 2, as a way of reminder. He says, But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. I pose the question, could it be the very hardship, the trial that you're going through is to grow your faith? Could it be the difficulty that you're experiencing, maybe the hindrance, the opposition, is for your faith to grow? Could it be that God is doing a work through that difficulty for his glory? And this is something that we picked up in the scriptures that we saw as Paul had this great trial, this great difficulty, and yet it led to his increase in his faith and gave him boldness and there was a great result of God's glory as people turned to God through their testimony. This is something that we see uh, in Thessalonians as we read here. This is something that I believe that God does do in our lives. We're encouraged in James chapter 1 where it says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. He says to let that endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so Paul comes to Thessalonica with boldness to speak the gospel. What's the gospel? Good news! Michael is louder than all of you guys, and I know that you can hear him at home. I've been told. It's the good news. The good news of the grace of God found in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And this is the message that Paul was bringing. And we see that Paul had this threefold approach. I thought this was helpful to us in his ministry to the Thessalonians. We see that in verse 7 of chapter 2, he came as this nurturing mother. It says in verse 8, having so fond of affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. We saw that he had approached as a working brother. We leave this in verse 9, where he says, You recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so as not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. He ministered to them. He approached them as a father would. Verse 11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. So that, verse 12, this is where we pick up where we left off, that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you 
into his own kingdom and glory. Lord God, as we commit ourselves now to the reading of the, and the hearing of your word, I pray that you would bless us. Lord, we pray that as we purpose ourselves in a time of corporate worship, Lord, that you were glorified. God, I ask that you would reveal your will to us through your word this morning. Lord, that you would speak to us individually and specifically. God, I'm thankful for the live stream ability and we pray for those at home right now. Lord, that you would touch them, that they would feel apart and not separate. We thank you, Lord, that we can have this in-person gathering. And God, we do pray as we have continued to pray and you've been so faithful to watch over our gatherings. Lord, you keep this place free from the virus. We're thankful for your faithfulness. That you've been so faithful to us, God. Speak to us now, I pray, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice here in verse 12. He's exhorting, he's, in, he's encouraging, he's imploring them that they would walk in a way that reflected the God who called them into his own glory. And I think the, the question is then, well, then who is this God? Who is this God that is doing this inviting? Because if we don't know who this God is and we don't know this kingdom that he's referring to, how would we then know to walk in a way that reflected that? Wednesday night, we had a, a lot of fun. If you're with us, um, I want to share a little bit. We were in Psalm 20, Psalm 20 and Psalm 21. We're going through the Psalms on Wednesday nights right now. And Psalm 20 is this beautiful Psalm. It's, it's like this prayer of blessing upon Israel as they're about to go into battle. And it's a prayer of victory. And there's something that was repeated there that, was, that stuck out to me very clearly and very plainly in uh, Psalm 20, verses 5 and 7. It's a re, it was a repeated theme, actually. But specifically, it had to do with this victory found in the name of our Lord God. And it said in verse, chapter 20, verse 5, he says, We will sing for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners May the Lord fulfill our petitions. And then he says in verse 7, Some boast in chariots and some in horses. These are, you know, physical uh, war implements. He says, But we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. And then in chapter 21, he goes on to celebrate the victory. The victory was found in the name of the Lord our God. In the Old Testament, I brought this up Wednesday night, in the Old Testament there are several names that are used in the original Hebrew for God. We may read in your text, you might just read, you know, it'll just come out as God. But if you were to look up what word was used, the original Hebrew for God, there are several different names that are used throughout the Old Testament for the word God. And what it does is it paints this picture for us of who this God is that is inviting us into his kingdom. And I want to go quickly through them. Um, we took some time to unpack them. Wednesday night. I'm just going to go through this kind of quick. When speaking to Moses, God said his name was I am. In Genesis 17, talking to Abram, it says that the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him that I am El Shaddai meaning the Lord God Almighty. In Genesis 14, it says that Melchizedek was the priest of the God Most High. This is El Elyon. He's called Adonai, Lord and Master. He's called Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. After Joshua overwhelmed Amalek, we read in Exodus 17 that God told Moses to write down this victory, make a memorial of it. And Moses did that, and then Moses builds this altar, and he names the altar, God is my banner. In Hebrew, it's Jehovah Nisai the Lord my miracle. Other names used, Jehovah Tisknu, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah 
Mekadishkim, the Lord sanctifies El Olom, the everlasting God of universe, Elum. God, Kwana, zealous, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace, Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of power. And if we take all of these different names and we create this statement, this is how it would read. This is who this, our God is. I am God Almighty, the Most High, Lord and Master of miracles, shepherd and healer, always there. I bring righteousness through sanctification. I am God of the universe, everlasting, eternal judge and creator, zealous to provide peace through my power. This is the God who has invited you into his kingdom. And we're to walk in a way, as it says here, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, that reflects this great honor. Really, it's a great invitation. The word Paul uses here, we read when it says call, right there in verse 12. In the original Greek, it's kaleo, and it means to invite. It's an invitation. You ever gotten an invitation to something? What comes with invitations? Normally, it's kind of detailed instructions, right? I got this neat invitation a few years back. We had a naval officer that used to attend church here, uh, Lieutenant Commander Russell Dix. And he was retiring from the Navy, and he asked me to give the invocation at his retirement ceremony. I had never been at a military retirement ceremony, and um, I had some questions, you know. Where is it at? When will it be? Is there a certain dress code? Um, and... Oh, there's the picture there. You don't have to leave that up very long. There he is, right there. <laughs> so I, I asked him, you know, where's it at? What will it be? What, what am I supposed to wear, you know? I wanted to show up at the right place, at the right time, with the right attire. And, uh, you know, the same thing happens when you're invited to a wedding. We just got back from Boston. My brother Micah married a girl named Jessica, who's now my sister-in-law. And uh, I don't think they're watching this because they're still doing their honeymoon thing. She had a lot of details. To, there was like the invitation for the people to attend, but then for us, a part of the wedding party, there was a lot of details. Very well organized. We had PowerPoints, we had emails, we had the picture day. Like every 15 minutes, there was stuff like scheduled. And you know, when I showed up to do the ceremony, somehow all the girls were wearing the same dress and all the guys were wearing the same shirt and pants, the bridesmaids and the groomsmen. I don't think it was a coincidence. <laughs> they were instructed. They were invited to be a part of the wedding ceremony. And so if we do this in the natural, why wouldn't we do this in the spiritual? God has invited you into his kingdom. You should be asking, what is this kingdom about? Who, who is this God that is inviting me? How can I honor this invitation? You know, what kind of message would it send to Commander Dix if I showed up super late? What kind of message would it send if I showed up in flip-flops and shorts and no shirt? Besides me personally being embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> would probably embarrass them. It's disrespectful. It's not honoring. What if I took my sister-in-law Jessica's little list and went, eh, it's not loving, it's unloving. It doesn't care. And considering that invitation that I received from Lieutenant Commander Dix, it was just an email. It wasn't the word of God. See where I'm going with this? Paul says here in verse 11, he was exhorting, he was encouraging, he was imploring that they would walk in such a way that honored this great invitation by God that God gave out and 
through God's word. I believe that we are given the time, location, the dress code of God's kingdom right here. This is our, our great invitation. And it has all the details. This gives us how to walk in a way that reflects this great invitation. How to walk in a way that honors the God of the universe, the God of the Bible. And so our lives and the way that we live and the way that we love and what we do should reflect God's word. We see this for the Thessalonians. As the gospel message went out to them, they had this great impact. Look at verse 13. He says, for this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. The gospel message that Paul brought was not the philosophies of man. He didn't bring Paul's four points on religion or come some sort of man-made religion. What he brought was the gospel, God's grace, the, God's plan of salvation. Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Not a thing of works. You know, when by faith you believe that God sent his only begotten son for your sins. And by faith you believe that God raised him from the dead. The scripture says that you're, you'll be saved. You won't be disappointed. In fact, even we have the promise of being sealed with the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption. It is a transformative work that happens in your life. Look at, I love this line in verse 13. At the end of it, it says, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. When you believe by faith, the word of God has a transformative power in your life. And not only does the, the message of the gospel perform its work in you, but when you take in the full counsel of God, when we say that, we mean the, the Bible here, the whole thing. When you take this in, it has a way to work in your life. It becomes our guide. Psalms 119, 105 says, your word is a lamp to my feet. It's a light to my path. Hebrews talks about it being alive and active. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and it's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from its sight, but all things are open, laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. Is there any other book on a shelf somewhere that could do that? God can speak to you in a new way. I mean, as you walk with the Lord, as you, as you seek counsel from God's word, it's amazing how you can know a scripture, you can know a verse, but you come to it and it's new and it's fresh and it speaks to you in that moment. I want to exhort you, I want to encourage you, I want to implore you to know God's word. Take it in, be regular with it. Purpose yourself to know it. I believe as you commit yourself to the reading and the hearing of God's word, as the scripture says, you'll be blessed. Figure out a way, you know, some people don't read very good, so they listen to audio. Some people need to do it in the morning. Some people need to do it at night. Figure out a way. Be regular with it. It'll perform a work. This is the promise that we have here. And it did for the Thessalonians. We saw here that Paul has written that there was seeable, there was tangible evidence of their response to the gospel message, to the word of God. He says, verse 14, for you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. 
For you also endured the same suffering of the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. What Paul is talking about here, the hostility that he's talking about was this hindrance of the good news of the gospel, that you're saved by grace, not works. This is what Ephesians 2.8 tells us. He says, Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. The Judaizers, as we have seen in other places, promoted this a what am I trying to say? A legalistic approach to God. Where it was a works based religion. That if you did this, then God would do that. They promoted that you needed to become Jew first to be saved. And then follow all the regulations that came with that. And Paul is saying they, these guys were hindering the work of the gospel because it's by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. He says here they're going to have trouble coming. Look at verse 16. You're hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. With the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. This is strong language that he used against those who would hinder the work of the gospel. To fill up a measure of their sins have wrath come to the utmost. God will deal with those who hinder the work of the gospel. Ultimately, though, this is, this is God's deal. We're encouraged in Romans 12, 9, 19. It says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I'll repay, says the Lord. So we don't have to worry if those, those are coming against the gospel, coming against what we believe. We know in the end, God will take care of it. He says, verse 17, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while in person, but not in spirit, were all more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Ultimately, Satan is the chief hinderer. And he will, as we read in Revelation, receive just penalty of his evil work. He'll be condemned. He'll be cast down. He'll be defeated. But for now, he is allowed to be a hindrance. I don't understand this. I, I have to be completely honest and transparent with you. I don't get this. It's above my pay grade. And it's something that I have to trust God in. Why evil is allowed. Though Satan may hinder, does not mean, though, that he stops the work. We don't need to let him win. Ephesians 6 tells us clearly that our real battle is not against the flesh and blood, but it's against the, the spiritual. You know, there was a mob that we saw in Philippi that formed against Paul and Silas. And they were put into prison, false accusations. They were beaten, but those weren't the real battles. There was a wicked force behind the scenes of those physical battles. In fact, Ephesians 6.12 
tells us that our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We're told there in Ephesians 6, that, therefore stand firm, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might, putting on his armor. Ephesians 6.13 says, so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So, are there hindrances in your life from Satan? Maybe. The Apostle Paul saw this and dealt with this. When you experience opposition to your faith, when you experience opposition to the growth of your faith, let's recognize it for what it is. It's a spiritual battle comes in so many forms. For a husband and wife, marital conflict. You guys, if you would just take any kind of conflict that you have with your spouse, and if you were just hit the pause button and say, let's see this for what it is. This is a spiritual battle. Then that's going to turn you guys around and you're going to pray together against the conflict that is happening. Recognize it for what it is. Anytime you step out in faith to, to be obedient to God's word, there's opposition. Recognize it for what it is. It's a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6 says that we need to fight the spiritual battle with the spiritual weapons, and he gives a whole list of the weapons to deal with that. But prayer can be the first one. Recognizing it is what it is, recognizing what it is. And the physical, to understand that the physical is just a manifestation of the spiritual. I believe we see that going on in our nation right now. Massive conflict all over. It's a spiritual battle. There is a real spiritual battle going on. And what's the motive of Satan? To divide. To create disunity. To disrupt peace. To get our focus off of Jesus and looking at stuff that's temporal. One thing here we see for Paul, though, though he was hindered, it didn't stop the work. He pivoted. Ever heard that term? You got to pivot? It's been like a theme for the last two years. <laughs> oh, okay, let's pivot. <laughs> Go this way. Oh, we got to pivot. Go this way. He pivoted. He couldn't be there in person. He's taken away in person, but not in spirit. So what does he do? We're going to see he writes a letter. And in chapter 3, we're going to see that he sent Timothy. So he couldn't physically go and be there because there was some sort of hindrance originated by Satan but Satan doesn't win. He writes a letter and he sends Timothy. And then guess what happens? We have the letter, which God sanctions as his word. And it becomes this great blessing to us because he was hindered and he didn't just let it be, let Satan win. It reminds me of, my, of our psalm Wednesday night. I, I don't know how it ties together. It was just on my mind. But in Psalm 21, verse 11, we read, Though they intended evil against you, 